Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful unto us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Mercifully grant, O God, that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. For without your help, we are unable to please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The second lesson from the book of Philippians, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote from prison, we read from chapter 1. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former <clears throat> preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 9. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones, who, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. The Gospel of the Lord.
Dear friends, once again, we'll look back at Mark chapter 9 and verses 42 through 47. We'll talk more about just now. Remember that as we heard in the readings as Christians, we are concerned that the word of God be proclaimed and that people hear it and believe. And in this particular section, that also means we're concerned that we ourselves remain in faith and that our lives help others to stay in faith. Last week, no, it wasn't last week, it's this week, I believe, the man from Michigan named Gregory Jarvis, who's 57 years old, evidently slipped while he was tying up his boat to a pier and fell and hit his head and fell into the water, and they found him later, and he had died. And neatly tucked away in his wallet, was a winning lottery ticket for a substantial sum of money. So that's just on the news right this week. And it seems that um, this has nothing to do with his soul, because of that we know nothing. But just at that outward story, he would say, there is a man that has everything, and yet has nothing. Earthly speaking, that is. So, it's a story of worth. And when we think of things that are worth something, it is always relative to what's worth even more. He had a winning lottery ticket in his pocket, but that's really not what he needed in the end. Maybe some um, shoes with more grip on the bottom, or maybe a rescuer who's nearby, or especially faith in his Lord and Savior for eternal life to come, and that's our hope for Mr. Jarvis. That's what he needed as a greater worth than the lottery ticket that was folded up so neatly. We're told, um, we're told in the scripture lessons today of the kingdom-mindedness that we have as Christians. It's our birthright, it's our heritage, it's our calling. And it's a matter of worth. You see, what makes us rich is not what's folded up in our pocket. And what we hope for Mr. Jarvis, in the big picture, is that he knew his Savior and is now eternally safe with his Lord in heaven. But we know that that's what is awaiting each one of us. And that's something that you cannot purchase even if you do win the lottery. And even if you bought a ticket this past week because it's a half a billion dollars almost, it still would not purchase the tremendous riches that we possess as a gift of our gracious God. The gift of heaven that comes through Christ is ours. It's an unchanging gift. It's a solid treasure that doesn't perish, spoil, or fade. And today, when we read that lesson from the gospel, there were some hard-sounding words of Jesus. And yet, if we kind of look through those words, we get to that treasure. Heaven as our great unchanging treasure that is worth everything, and yet costs us nothing. You notice right away that the the sermon text had hard words, tough words of our Lord Jesus. There wasn't a lot of good news in that section that we're looking at right now. But one thing that is highlighted when Jesus says, it would be better if you were thrown overboard. It would be better if you cut this off or that off. One thing that comes to the surface is this. What tremendous value Christ places on souls that he died for and how much he wants those souls to be in heaven with them, with him, when they die. And he doesn't want anything or anyone to get in the way, whether we get in the way of ourselves or let something get in the way of our faith or we get in the way of others. So here are some of these hard words of Jesus. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. Can you picture the Lord Jesus saying those words? 
And yet that's exactly what he said. A large millstone. So a millstone, do you remember the, the account of Samson? When they finally they, they, they put out his eyes, right? And he ends up where the donkeys normally do this, pushing this gigantic round stone, because he's so strong, pushing it and pushing it where it grinds the grain, a millstone. They had smaller versions of those too. But whether it's a giant one or the small one, it's still enough to pull my neck down to the bottom. And that's what Jesus says. He's concerned with so much concern for the value of every single soul that he died for. And he wants nothing or no one to take them away or cause them to lose their faith. And the souls that he's concerned about at the beginning, he says, these little ones who believe in me. Little children, little babies. Jesus once was indignant at what we're told. When they said, don't bother Jesus with the children. He was indignant. Let the little children come unto me. Suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not. And from that concern to little children, which we share too, for our children, right? We share for the children of our congregation and for our town. That's why I put so much effort into bringing them the word. But from that concern to children, it goes right upward till our ancient days. Now, these hard words of Jesus cause us, perhaps, to do some uncomfortable soul-searching. If anyone would do anything, or say anything, or live in a certain way, or carry themselves somehow, that leads little children who believe in Jesus to go astray, it would be better if a millstone was pushed or put around their neck and they were cast overboard. And then we start to analyze our lives as adults or as older children toward the younger. And has everything that we've ever said or done in their view been a stellar example of the faith that we hold to? Have there been times when they have seen us not practicing what we preach? Or they have watched us and maybe been confused, wondering whether or not the first commandment that says, you shall have no other gods which have fear, love, and trust in God above all things, is really something that we take to heart, not just the little children, but other believers that know us? Is it possible that we have become stumbling blocks at times to the faith of others? These are all rhetorical questions, aren't they? Because the answer is yes. I know it is. I know it is for me. Thank God that um, he is not commanding us to go and start pushing each other off piers or off boats with big rocks tied around our necks. Because the same Lord who said these hard words about the tremendous value of faith in him and heaven as our home and keeping people in faith, that same Lord is the very one who promises forgiveness. He's the very one who instead calls us to repent and trust in him when we see those kinds of things, when we analyze our life and say, you know what, there have been times, God, forgive me, and if there are times now, God, change me. He calls us to that repentance trusting in his forgiveness, but also paying attention to our ways so that our children and that our neighbors and that our fellow Christians do see that we know what's really worth something, what our greatest treasure is. And the day to start that is always today, isn't it? Because I can't do anything about my whole past life Suppose I'd call up some high school friends and tell them I'm sorry. And I could probably tell my kids that too, but John Wayne once said, never apologize. It's a sign of weakness. So maybe I'll just try it better today. To honor the Lord and let people see what my greatest treasure is. You too, right? We are kingdom-minded. 
with a concern for souls, not only that the gospel be preached, but that it shows through us. And Jesus' hard words aren't over yet. Because he, he switches the subject just a little bit. For how we serve as examples to others, then he says, well, guard your own hearts too, because this is a dangerous world spiritually. Be willing to give up anything, even a lottery ticket in the pocket if you have to. That might get in the way of your faith. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. You'd think we would see a lot of people with one eye walking around. On crutches. What else? With no hand. But that's not the case. Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, if your eye causes you to sin, get rid of it if that's what it is. But he has already told us in Scripture that it's not your hand or your eye or your foot that's the problem. Out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, all that stuff, right? It's the sin that we have inside of us that comes out these things, so it's not our hand that we have to cut off. But guard our hearts. Guard our hearts. And remember that the, of all the things that are worth something in our world, and all the things that we can spend time on and money on, what's really greater worth, of course, is Christ, our faith in him and our heaven to come. <coughs> Don't let anything obscure that. And there might be times when Christians do have to do some cutting. Not cutting off parts. But what? Cutting ties at times, if there is anything or any group or any temptation that's continuously endangering the soul, what might some of that be? Maybe the wrong crowd? Maybe too much drink? Maybe too much of a hobby? Maybe too much work? Whatever it might be that's causing us to stumble, be willing to step away. For the sake of our own souls, guard our hearts, remembering that our greatest treasure that never changes still is Christ and the heaven that he brings us. But at the same time, that great treasure costs us nothing. Not even the two dollars it costs that man to have in his lottery ticket in the back pocket. It costs us nothing. But that doesn't mean it doesn't cost, right? The eternal security and the eternal heaven that we have costs Jesus everything. The holy, precious blood of Christ who came and stepped into our earth to live for us and to pay a price, to sacrifice himself on the altar of the cross that we might go free, that is a price that has been paid. Not out of our pockets, but out of the pocket of the Heavenly Father who sent him. What a pleasure it is. It's a pleasure for us as pastors. We get to do it because we get to do it in front of a whole bunch of people. But you can do it when you talk to each other and when you, when you share these messages with each other, with your own children, when you support it, when you pay for it, when you, not pay for it as in getting it, pay for it as in paying missionaries to do it, when you pray for it. But we get to stand here and just on a regular basis announce God's forgiveness Tell a group of people that Jesus died for them and that their sins are washed away and everything is okay. To stand and kind of make a sermon that says that in the end, it's always the same message, isn't it? By the way, don't forget, Jesus died for you. Your sins are forgiven. Go home and be at peace. Come back next week so we can tell you again. To teach children, what a blessing that is. And what a true message it is. That Jesus died to pay for all those sins, even the ones that I know that you probably have in your life and I know that I have in my life, and those are the sins that would have earned me a millstone. For the times when I look back and say, oh, I should have been a better example here or there or there, all washed clean, as if God doesn't even remember it. Thankfully, Christian people are pretty forgiving too, aren't they? <clears throat> Think of all the people that have wronged you over time. You get over it, don't you? And you, you forget and forgive as well. Forgive trespasses as we've been forgiven. It's part of the blessing of being a Christian family, isn't it? 
And so what's our response to that beautiful message? A life offered in thanksgiving to God. It, it's, not a, it's not a big sacrifice on our part, is it? To want to guard our, not only our own hearts, but then kind of pay attention to our own lives so that we might, by our examples, help people, especially the young, um, become closer to their Savior, not farther. That's not a great sacrifice. That's a blessed privilege. It's not a great sacrifice on our part to, to try to watch for temptations in our lives and separate ourselves from them if we know we're continually being tripped up. Guard our own faith. That's not a sacrifice. It's, it's a blessing. It's not a big sacrifice to use our, our words, our lives, our prayers for the good of our fellow Christians. It's a privilege. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee, the hymn says. We'll sing it later. Dead man is floating in the water with a winning lottery ticket in his pocket. You and I are living with an eternal treasure. It's worth everything. It costs us nothing. Share it with others. Amen. Lord God, we thank you that your word is being shared throughout this world by people we know and by people we do not know. We thank you that by the Spirit's power, your holy word has borne fruit and brought souls to faith, including our own. Help us to regard the gospel message of Christ to always be our greatest treasure, which brings us an eternity in heaven. Help us as we give careful attention to our daily lives, that all we say and do might serve to lead other souls closer to your side. Today we also commit to your care the family of Virgin Jekyll called to heavenly rest. We ask that you give them the peace and comfort of knowing that heaven awaits all who trust in Christ your Son, and through him a reunion in glory will come. We also pray that you bless Bob Wish in his upcoming surgery, that all may go well and he is brought to healing quickly and completely as he trusts you to provide what is best. We ask it all in Jesus' name, and in his name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Mm -hmm.